Hey, this is Jocelyn Compton. Congratulations. Take a deep breath. You made it to the final section of the book. Let's talk about the respiratory system, starting with anatomy. Should be a pretty familiar picture to you. Just two lungs, the trachea and the two bronchi. But let's do a little more orientation to lung anatomy and build the foundation for some of the pathophys concepts that we're going to discuss later. So the respiratory tree is anatomically and functionally divided into conducting and respiratory zones. What's the conducting zone? The conducting zone goes from the nose to the terminal bronchioles and functions to warm, humidify, and filter the air that we breathe. So why is this called the conducting zone? Because it basically just transmits air. It's considered anatomic dead space. So that does not participate in gas exchange. Histologically, what might you expect to see at the end of the bronchi? Cartilage and goblet cells. What's beyond that? The terminal bronchioles. The terminal bronchioles with pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells and smooth muscle. Okay, so what's the respiratory zone? Well, the respiratory zone is made up of respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. It's part of the lung where gas exchange occurs. And, as we're going to discuss a little later, it's a major site of pulmonary pathology. In the conducting system, pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells are important for sweeping mucus secretions out of the lung. These cells are damaged by the products of cigarette smoking, which is why smokers are more susceptible to pulmonary infections than non-smokers. These ciliated cells stop at the respiratory zone, and it's the alveolar macrophages that clear debris here. Pneumocytes are high yield for the boards because they are so important in gas exchange and respiratory physiology. First, let's talk about type 1 pneumocytes. Type 1 pneumocytes make up most of the alveolar surface. What's the cellular morphology? Well, these squamous cells are thin and flat, which makes them great for gas exchange at the alveolar capillary interface. Type 2 pneumocytes are less abundant, but are extremely important. You can see them here in this histology slide of alveolar tissue. Type 2 pneumocytes secrete pulmonary surfactant from lamellar bodies and is the pulmonary surfactant which decreases the alveolar surface tension. Interestingly, these cells can differentiate either into type 1 or type 2 cells and are the ones that proliferate during lung damage. Here's a little mnemonic for you. Type 2 goes with lamellar, and the 2 kind of looks like the double L in lamellar. So what other cells are important for you to know about? How about Clara cells? Clara cells are non-ciliated columnar cells with secretory properties. Where are they found? They're found in the bronchioles and not in the alveoli. They protect the bronchial epithelium by secreting a surfactant-like solution and also degrade toxins via what pathway? That's right. Clara cells degrade toxins via the cytochrome P450 pathway. So a flash quiz. Where are pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells found? Only in the conducting system, where they're sweeping out dirt and mucus. Okay, let's get back to surfactant. So I said a little earlier that surfactant is secreted by type 2 pneumocytes. What's the main component of surfactant? Well, it's mostly made up of a phospholipid called dipalmatoyl phosphatidylcholine. Try saying that five times fast. Which allows surfactant to decrease surface tension in the alveoli. According to the law of Laplace, the collapsing gas pressure equals two times the surface tension over the radius. I think it's also helpful to sketch out this relationship for yourself. So less surface tension means less gas pressure is needed to overcome collapsing pressure and to keep the alveoli open. This is really important during expiration where the radius of the alveoli decrease. So collapsing pressure rises. So what's the bottom line? With surfactant decreasing surface tension, you should see increasing lung compliance and decrease the work of breathing because more alveoli remain open at the end of a breath. And if they do collapse, it requires less gas pressure to reinflate them. Finally, surfactant synthesis is a major part of fetal lung maturity. Later, we're going to talk about neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. 
which is where you don't have enough surfactant after birth for efficient respiration. And we'll also talk about how the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio works. Understanding the anatomy of the lung, particularly the relations between different lobes of the lung, has radiographic and clinical significance. So you're going to see this on your boards. What do the lungs look like grossly? The trachea divides into right and left main stem bronchi, which serve the right and left lungs. One board testable fact is that the right main stem bronchus takes off from the trachea at a more vertical angle than the left, which explains why foreign body aspirations and unilateral intubations are more common on the right side. The right lung consists of three lobes, while the left lung has two lobes and a lingula. The lingula is the homologue of the right middle lobe, but this space in the left lobe is occupied by the heart. So the lingula is also Latin for little tongue. So this is sometimes referred to as the tongue of the lung. It's best to consider the lung from several angles. As you see, looking anterior to posterior, the lower lobe of the right lungs is mostly obscured by the superior and middle lobes, suggesting a more posterior position of this lobe. This is also demonstrated on the left, with the relationship between the superior and inferior lobes. In terms of lung borders, on the front of the chest, the apices of the lung extend two to four centimeters above the clavicles. So if you're stabbed in the neck right above the clavicle, you're still likely to hit lung. On the back, the apices extend to T1, and the base of the lungs extend to T10 on exhalation and T12 on deep inspiration. So if you do a needle thoracentesis on the back to drain a pleural effusion, where are you going to end up? The location may vary a bit, but you'll usually end up in the 6th to 8th intercostal space at the mid-axillary line. Okay, let's put this knowledge to use. So what lobe does this pneumonia lie in? It's on the right side. So how many lobes do you have to choose from? Just three. You can also tell it's not in the right upper lobe because that area is completely clear. You can tell it's in the right middle lobe because of how well it follows the horizontal fissure. And it fades inferiorly so that you can clearly see the right hemidiaphragm. Because you can see the right hemidiaphragm, it's not in the right lower lobe. In contrast, this is a right lower lobe pneumonia. Here, you can't see the diaphragm at all, and the superior lung space looks totally clear. From a surgical and radiology standpoint, there are several important structures that perforate the diaphragm at different levels, and lots of mnemonics to help you out. So, the IVC passes through the diaphragm at T8. The esophagus and the vagus penetrate at T10. And the descending aorta, thoracic duct, and azagous vein enter at T12. Here's how you can remember it. I ate 10 eggs at 12. The diaphragm is the primary muscle of inspiration. This muscle is innervated by the phrenic nerve, which comes off of C3, 4, and 5. Just remember, C3, 4, and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. If the diaphragm is irritated, where will patients report pain? In the shoulder and the trapezius ridge. What kind of pain is this? It's referred visceral pain. 